In fact, the, 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 the atomic testing in the 60s, which was the largest injection of radioactivity into the environment that has ever occurred, and, and maybe up until Fukushima, actually, because we don't know yet. This, this amount of radioactivity uh, into the global environment actually caused the current cancer epidemic. So if you're looking for the cause of the cancer epidemic which began in about 1980, it is the strontium-90 that was injected into the world atmosphere between 1959 and 63. And we know this because the, the trend in the cancer in countries with high rainfall, where there's high fallout, exactly follows the trend in strontium-90 contamination of milk. So we've got to the point now where I've finished that part. That part tells us all that the current radiation risk model is wrong, we have to stop nuclear power, and now let's apply that to Fukushima. Now Fukushima was an accident that was almost inevitable. All over the country, scientists, uh, mostly physicists I have to say, I have a rather low opinion of physicists, um, because they don't actually con connect with reality very often. They, they live in some kind of ethereal, mathematical wonderland. Uh, and it enables them to do things which are really quite insane. But they build nuclear power stations and they think they can control them and, and, and they put these substances that are fantastically dangerous inside a metal box and then they put another metal box around that and then they put all sorts of complicated backup systems and rods and poles and you know uh, electronic goo and what have you which they say are backup systems which stop these things from getting out. But basically they are inevitably going to get out. Because, and when they do, they're extremely dangerous. And we've seen this happen now all over the place. There are lots and lots of minor accidents. There are quite a few not so minor accidents. There are a few pretty bad accidents. And there was a really hairy accident, which was Chernobyl, which, which everybody tried to cover up, incidentally. The massive increase in cancer and ill health following Chernobyl. Like this, I was telling about Tom Dell, about the Swedish stuff. And eventually something bad was going to, even worse was going to happen, and it happened, and that was Fukushima. So I won't go on and on, I'm sure you've all saw, seen the films, you've seen the explosion, you know, you, you've seen it all on video, and you want to know more or less what the outcome is and what we can do about it, I suppose. We have had three or four nuclear reactors in a meltdown situation. Right from the beginning I thought this was going to happen, and I went on the BBC and said that this is extremely serious. And then the nuclear industry brought on a whole load of stooges saying, oh, well, you know, it's not really a problem, it's just a hydrogen explosion, and of course the, the, the pressure vessels are still intact and so on. But anyone who saw reactor number three, which is the plutonium, which is a reactor which is running on a special fuel called NOx, mixed oxide fuel, contains plutonium, anyone who saw that explode on YouTube will think that that cannot be a hydrogen explosion. It just blew this stuff thousands of feet up into the air and it went up vertically. And then of course there's some chemical problem there because uh, although hydrogen is formed when the zirconium fuel rods react with water, they don't, oxygen isn't formed. If you, anyone who's a chemist will tell you if metals react with steam, they produce hydrogen. But then they react, they produce the oxide of the metal, they don't produce oxygen. So you have to have oxygen and hydrogen to, to, to have an explosion. So right from the beginning I thought, not a hydrogen explosion, it's blowing a whole lot of stuff up in the air. And then I discovered that actually, um, because there was nowhere that the Japanese had to, to put their spent fuel, because you know when you have a nuclear reactor from time, you burn up all the fuel, and then you have a load of spent fuel rods, you have to put it in a nuclear waste repository. But they don't have a nuclear waste repository. In fact, nobody has a nuclear waste repository at the moment, although they're trying to build one in Finland and Sweden. So they, they store it on top of the nuclear reactor. Can you imagine a better place to store it? So anyway, they had this bright idea, since it's so radioactive anyway, on top, so then we've got to put it somewhere, we're going to put it on top of the nuclear reactor, you see? So, and this is not a small amount of stuff, we're talking about hundreds of tons of, of radioactive fuel. When Chernobyl exploded, the, the contents of the Chernobyl reactor, the RBMK reactor, was about 250 tons of, of uranium fuel. We've got about 2,500 tons of fuel at Fukushima. And most of it is in these uh, fuel rod assemblies which, which, which live under water. So it's basically like a fish pond. And they put all of these fuel rods inside this fish pond. And then they stick the fish pond on top of the reactor. So when the reactor exploded at Fukushima, it blew all this crap completely up into the air. And all these fuel rods went pitter patter, the ones that hadn't vaporized, went pitter patter, pitter patter, you know, over an area of, of several square miles. 
but it, nobody said anything about this, of course. You know, we, we heard that the, that, the, that the reactor pressure vessels were intact and there was no other problem and so on. And then right from the beginning, the International Atomic Energy Agency, who are another bunch of crooks who work with the nuclear industry, they went in there and they produced reports about, about the contamination. And we know from doing, from just from the mathematical analysis of the re these reports that they were lying, that the dose rates they were measuring on the ground didn't fit in with the contamination that they made. And we know now, and we, in fact we could calculate then, that the contamination goes out to about 100 kilometers. So they've taken people out of the 30, out of the 20 kilometer zone and then out of the 30 kilometer zone, but actually there are people living inside 100 kilometers in towns like Koryama, which was the one that I went to, that, that I'm supporting this court case in, and other, other, and Fukushima city itself, which is about 100 kilometers, and a place called Eizu Wakazumi that I went to a couple of weeks ago with a, with a gamma spectrometer. We know that that area is extremely contaminated. So what, what I, the first thing that I, I did was to work out on the basis of the ECRR risk model and on the basis of this Tondal Sweden um, analysis, how many people would die. So right from the beginning, I, was, I went out on Russia today with this calculation. I, I gave a paper in Berlin on this issue. And I worked out that approximately in the next 10 years, in the 100 kilometer area, and this is a prediction, about two, 200,000 people will get with about cancer, about 200,000 people. And over 50 years, it's about 400,000 people out to 200 kilometers. And out to 200 kilometers takes it pretty close to, to Ibaraki, which is like another. So we're talking about 10 million people here and about 400,000 cancers. And I think that's quite conservative, frankly. Now, I asked, one of the ways of, test, of looking at all this is to look at car air filters. So this is just, just briefly tell you about this. I got four car air filters from Tokyo, from the Japanese newspapers who I'm working with. And we looked at the concentration of these radionuclides in these car air filters. One of these air filters was from Chiba, which is, uh, Chiba city is, is actually to the east of Tokyo. So we're talking a long way away from Fukushima now. But remember, Tokyo's got a population of 36 million people. So the interesting thing is whether or not there's any contamination down as far as that, because what the IAEA is saying and what, and what the Japanese government is saying is there isn't any. So inside this car air filter, we can, put a, we can put a gamma spectrometer detector on top of it, which I've got. And we immediately saw that there was enormous amounts of cesium-137 and cesium-134 and various other nasty radionuclides. And because we know what the size of the engine of the car is, and we know how many cubic capacity, what its cubic capacity is and what its revolutions is and how many miles it, it drove, because I asked them this, we can work out how much air it breathed. So we know how much of this stuff's in the filter, how much radiation's in the filter, and we know how much air it breathes. So we can work out the concentration of radionuclides per cubic meter of air. And what we find when we do that was that in Chiba City, the concentration of cesium was 300 times higher than the peak concentration in the air at Harwell in England at the time of the, at the peak of the global weapons testing. 300 times higher. So this was a, this was a, a concentration at Harwell um, measured in 1963, and we know that that, that that level of contamination led to the current cancer epidemic that, we, that we, we all know from about 1980 onwards. You know that cancer has gone up by about 30%. Everybody has had somebody who's developed cancer. Women breast cancer has gone through the roof. And the reason for this is this contamination by strontium-90 from the weapons fallout. But we now know that in Chiba City, it's 300 times higher than that. And in, in, and in these cars that were 100 kilometers away, 100 kilometers away, 60 miles away from, uh, from the Fukushima reactor site, it's 1,000 times higher. So the concentration of cesium in this filter is 1,000 times higher per cubic meter than it was at the peak of the weapons testing. So that's as far as we've got now. What we've got to now is a situation where we're trying to get the, 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 the Japanese government to, to get the people out, to get all of the people out of the area um, up to 100 kilometers from, from the site. So I've been on Japanese TV accusing the Japanese government of a war crime in peacetime. Because effectively that's what they're doing. If you allow people to be contaminated with substances which have a finite chance of killing them, then this is an assault. It's a tort. Uh, you know, you, it, 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 and, and if you're preventing those people from going away, or if you're not helping them to go away, you're not taking the children out and so on, 
What you're doing is killing people, and this is, this is a crime, it's criminal irresponsibility. So I've said all this stuff. Whether they'll do anything or, or not, I don't know. But I can tell you that the Japanese people in the north are really quite, quite upset about it all. Um, so finally, I want to say something about nuclear generally. Then we can talk. Then we can just talk uh, amongst ourselves. I think I've said most of what I wanted to say. Um, yeah. <laughs> See, what you have to realise is that is that the nuclear power, the nuclear energy issue, which I've cross swords with quite a few Greens now. I mean, including George Monbiot recently. The, nu the nuclear power issue is one which is probably the most critical issue for the human race throughout in, in human history. What we know from the genotoxicity of these substances is that, is that they destroy fertility. Uh, for instance, in, in Jerusalem, a study was done some years ago which showed that the, fertility, that the male sperm count was, was dropping at such a rate that if it continued to drop at that rate by year 2020 there would be no more people, there would be no children. We know at the moment that there is massive reduction in fertility generally worldwide. We, we hear all this stuff about IVF and so on, where you, where you stick in something and flush all the eggs out and so forth. But actually, when I was young, you know, in the 60s, you only had to shake somebody's hand and they became pregnant. It, it, it was as bad as that. Well, maybe as good as that. Anyway, but whatever it was, it was. But it's not like that now. I can tell you, people have to go to the doctor and have all sorts of treatments and, you know, try this method and try that method. So, and the reason for that, and the reason for the loss of the birds, and the reason for the loss of the, of the animals and the fish and so on, is that the larval stages, in our case the embryonic stages, are extraordinarily sensitive to radiation. Our, our genetic material is extraordinarily sensitive to these substances like uranium which binds to DNA, strontium-90 which binds to DNA because they both mimic calcium, and then they whack into the DNA and destroy it, and then you don't have children. So that's one thing. So we, we are destroying every life form on this planet by, by signing up to a system where we continually pollute the planet with radioactivity, not from nuclear uh, Disasters, not from well, yes, from those as well, but just from places like Hinkley Point that sit there quietly on the coast of Somerset and produce radionuclides and cause an increase in breast cancer in those people living in Burnham on Sea downwind, an increase in infant mortality in those people living downwind, and nobody does anything about it. The, the local health authority won't do anything about it. They bring in they bring in all sorts of committees that say it, it's not possible and that the radiation doses are too low. They fall back on the ICRP and say, well, the ICRP says it's fine, so it must be fine. But what? But my message to the planet is this: that if we don't do something about nuclear, that is that that will be the end of all of us. That is the most. And never mind about global warming. Global warming is is, is, is nothing compared to what's been done to us already and what is being done to us now. One last thing: Fukushima hasn't stopped. About nuclear, that, that is that that will be the end of all of us. That is the most. And never mind about global warming. Global warming is is, is is nothing compared to what's been done to us already and what is being done to us now. One last thing: Fukushima hasn't stopped. I was at the press conference there. Uh, and one of the press guys there told me that, that, that recently the Japanese Prime Minister had been told by the head of TEPCO that the reactors, combined reactors, were producing 10 to the 14 becquerels per hour. All right? Now, a becquerel is one disintegration per second. It's a measure of radioactivity. 10 to the 14 is 1 and 14 noughts. Okay? It's 100 trillion uh, disintegrations per hour. What that means is that, it's that, that uranium and plutonium in these reactors which are open to the air now and hardly melted through at the bottom are still fissioning and producing huge amounts of radioactivity in the form of particles and gases and substances which are ending up now in Hawaii, made, that have been measured in Hawaii, plutonium, in the Marianas, in Guam, in the, on the eastern coast of the United States, in Canada, there's some guy driving up and down Canada with a Geiger counter finding huge amounts of radioactivity in puddles. Even here, we got Michael Misha to get the information from the Atomic Weapons Authority establishment in Aldermaston, where they have filters, and we found high levels of plutonium, only in two filters, but, but this is still a hot particle of plutonium, so somebody can inhale it. 